Community is defined as a social unit, a group of living things with a commonality such as norms, religion, values, customs, or identity. Communities may share a sense of place situated in a given geographical area, like a country, village, town, or neighborhood, or in a virtual space through communication platforms, like we're creating a nonprofit community with Small and Gutsy. Communities represent those durable relationships that extend beyond immediate familial ties that serve us when we seek advice, safety, connection, and guidance. More typical, communities are highly sought after when they fulfill a need, as in a town or city providing their residents with the best services, including good schools, sanitation services, police and fire responsiveness. Law enforcement is a key element in any community because the police department is designed to serve, to safeguard lives and property, to protect the innocent and the weak, to ensure peace and respect the constitutional rights of all people. The police ideally shouldn't be separate from the community they serve, but viewed as part of the community, continuously building the bond that strengthens the existing community while fostering the future of the next generation. You'll learn in a moment how one Los Angeles police department is significantly lowering the number of juvenile offenders by offering an approach to and with the community that focuses on character building, career development, family support, and safe spaces to play, learn, and grow. Welcome to Small and Gutsy, a podcast featuring interviews with nonprofit and social impact organizations under $10 million. My name is Laura Whitkoff, and I'm excited and proud to be your host. My hope is that you love the stories as much as we do, and perhaps you will find needed services, a job, volunteer, invest in, or donate. Feel free to pass along any valuable information you hear today to others, and remember to send me the name of any organization you'd like featured at Reach Us at the Intrinsic Group. Hollenbeck Powell was founded in 1992 through the efforts of the Hollenbeck Division of the Los Angeles Police Department and community residents to implement sports activities to high-risk youth in response to the juvenile crime increase in the area. Through this partnership of community and law enforcement, Hollenbeck Powell's mission is to nurture young people to become responsible, productive, and law-abiding citizens by offering character-building, educational sports, financial literacy, and life-enhancing programs to low- and moderate-income families. Some of those programs we'll learn about today are Pal Up, Get It Straight, Sports for Kids, and Life Camera Action. are governed by a board comprised of community leaders, law enforcement, and business professionals. They envision a community without crime where children have access to opportunity and where peace officers help drive the community's vitality. Truly a beautiful vision. They are, in fact, building the bond between cops and kids. I am so excited to introduce my guest today, Executive Director Lorraine Garcia, Officer Donald Levere, or known as DJ, and Media Instructor Ignacio Oliveros, also known as Iggy. So let's get started. Welcome Lorraine, DJ, and Iggy. Please share your passion about Hallenbeck Powell and your deep connection and commitment to what led to your involvement. Lorraine is executive director. Do you want to start? I'll like put it on you first. Thank you, Laura. Thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. In 1999, I was introduced to Hollenbeck Pal. I worked in an organization that we gave the Pal program some funding. So my job at that time was to oversee this process and to be of any assistance if I, if I could. And at the time, it was four officers that were running this program. And in 1999, because of the crime rate that was rising, the department mm -hmm. was going to shut down this unit, but decided to keep one of the officers there who had started a soccer program. Mm. So I then decided to volunteer as I figured here's an individual who doesn't live in the community, doesn't yeah. have any kids going to school in this community, but is willing to get up at five o'clock in the morning on Saturdays to come and line the field. As I learned more about the PAL program, I just fell in love with the whole concept of having officers you know, engage with kids, and I saw healing taking place. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a very similar community, and I was afraid of the cops. Many of these kids in these types of communities are afraid because they only see maybe a part of what the department does, which is arrest somebody, right? It's, it's somebody in their family. And so... 
I, I tell the group that they should start a nonprofit so they can get more money and, and serve more kids. Before I knew it, um, when they went down from four officers to one officer, I decided to really get involved and help develop programs with Officer Glenda Brooks, who served as the executive director for many years. And I walked away from my job to start the nonprofit with her, and it's been the best decision I've ever made. I've always wanted to be able to find a way to help kids really reach you know, their potentials, but more importantly, believe, believe in themselves, believe that you know they can do it despite you know, their circumstances at home, despite where they live, despite, you know, what they don't have, but to know that those things are going to build a lot of resilience for them. And so all of it since 2002 was volunteer base. And so everybody asks us, like, how are you getting these kids and these parents to stay? And I always say it's because I hope they know we sincerely care. You really speak from your heart and your experience. And I think the other thing that I just want to pick up on is your observation of the healing that took place or takes place. It was a determination and drive that you had to say, I can't let go of this opportunity. And you took a risk. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like it not only paid off, but it filled you. Oh, absolutely. I, I tell everybody I have the best job ever. I wanted to add a, a little tagline to what LAPD uses to serve, protect, to serve, protect, and heal, because there really is an amazing healing process that happens. They bond with them, the parents do, so you know, it makes a safer and more beautiful community. Because then people know, oh, that's so-and-so's child, or, you know, it, it feels like there's a connecting opportunity there. I love it. In fact, in one of the videos I watched on your website, you have this little child saying, I love coming to play soccer here, not only because I love soccer, but their police are here and I feel so safe with them and I get to play with them. I mean, it was really touching. I loved that. It was great. Kids know and people know when you care. DJ and Icky, share your passion. I come from a different um, perspective, point of view, because I come from the world of media. I was trained as a video editor and a camera guy, quote unquote. And then I first was introduced to PAL because they needed somebody to help them edit some videos way back in the day, over 10 years ago. And so I started doing some work for them. And that's how I started to know more about what they do by crafting these public service announcements that showcase their story. One day they got some money, some funding, and they said, Iggy, you want to come on board and help us create a program for kids from scratch? And I never thought that I was going to be a teacher, ever. So I was scared, right? I'm like, wait a minute, me? It wasn't until I really was in it, giving kids cameras and, you know, teaching them what I know, just opened my eyes. I have a lot of passion for, for this job. And hearing Lorraine retell the story of Pal, I think, too, it also comes from the origins of PAL. Lorraine and Glenda started it with a lot of heart and passion. It just manifests, I think, to mm -hmm. the rest of the departments and the rest of the staff. I know that I, I feel that. It creates a, a great synergy. It sounds like it gets translated into the culture of the organization itself. So not only do the participants, the kids and the youth, get to feel it in terms of the programmatic aspect, but internally within your staff. Connecting with the, with the young people, Lorraine mm -hmm. said, if they do not feel that you're connecting with them, mm -hmm. they're not gonna change their behavior. It's gonna be more difficult to get them to change that behavior. But if they know that you care, mm -hmm. that makes all the difference. True, and I love the fact that you've taken the concept and the idea of media and a skill and an application to these kids' lives where they get to participate, and you'll talk more programmatically in a minute, but uh, where they get to participate in skill building and learning about equipment and recording and being connected to an issue that they care about. We'll get to that in a second, but I want to uh, bring in Officer LeVere or DJ as your name. Yes, DJ works just fine. Yeah. I'm not formal, not formal at all. Tell us about your passion as a police officer as part of this organization. Like Ignacio, my path to becoming a Hollenbeck Powell officer was a, a little ironic in the sense that never in my life had I ever even thought to be a police officer or that I wanted to be a police officer. I think in my when I was a kid, I even probably said before, like, oh, I'd never want to be a police officer. Growing up, 
where I grew up, I grew up in Long Beach, uh, California, single parent household. But even though I had a single parent household, I had an amazing support system in the people that were around me. And so when I got a little older, you know, maybe high school, one of my passions I knew was to, in some way, shape or form, give back to youth. And so I envisioned that ultimately when I was a little older and when I was established being a part of maybe a big brother, big sister program, still never imagined myself being a police officer. Fast forward, all of a sudden here I am in this uniform, you know, in this badge, but it has been such a blessing because under the umbrella of LAPD and, you know, being introduced to the, the Hollenbeck Powell program, I have been able to live out that passion every single day that I come to work. You know, it really is a passion of mine. If I can be, you know, half of the support system to these kids that we work with that I had growing up. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times I think to myself, okay, I grew up same area kind of as we work in just maybe a different demographic, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what's the difference, you know, I kind of realized the difference was the support system. And so just being able to be, you know, a positive role model, be a positive part of these kids support system means the world to me. It really is a blessing to be a blessing. So, you know, if I can be a blessing to these kids or, you know, in any way, shape or form, then um, I'm extremely happy, extremely happy. Your genuineness and your heart comes through in that. And so I'm Thank so you. happy that you were able to find this combination within your career choice that bridges the giving back to youth and also the expectations of a police officer to serve, protect. And I love Lorraine's added on to that to heal. I think we need to dedicate this podcast to the healing community aspect. Right law enforcement right. and community together to heal. I love that. You guys are an example of that, actually. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, when I came to PAL, I stepped into a well-oiled machine. PAL was already doing amazing things. And so just to be a part of this program, to be a part of this organization, to be a part of this team, I always say about these kids, real recognizes real, you know, and it, it doesn't yeah. get it doesn't get more real than a child. Like Ignacio said, they know when you're being genuine. They know when you're being sincere. Everyone in this organization, you know, all of our, our leadership, our case managers, our program leaders, we have really, really found, you know, a team that is really just sincere about the work that we do. Share with me the programs. I mentioned four as a part of the introduction and share just because I want our listeners to know what you offer both the younger kids and the older kids and how you see that impact them. I'll talk about uh, get it straight. It's the program that both myself and Glenda developed, and it was it came out of the needs of the parents asking us for help with their kids. They're not going to school. My kids are not listening to me. My kids are hanging on their own. Proud of friends. My kids are starting to do drugs and alcohol. So initially, we started taking them to one of the correctional facilities so they can see some of the kids that are incarcerated. And we realized that that was kind of a band-aid, right? The kids were good for a couple of weeks. We realize if we don't help them understand the bigger picture, both the kids and their parents, because we also found that a lot of our parents didn't know juvenile law. We created, you know, uh, get it straight with the, with the intent of educating these kids and the parents together so they both heard the information to really help them understand that what they do now can be a positive effect or a negative effect. And if it's a negative effect, how is that going to trickle down? Throughout their lives. And then we decided that we knew, really needed to help support our parents. We created a 12 week educational component that both the kid and their parent attend. So they're getting all this information together. All the while, both of them knowing that we're not here to judge them or say they're doing anything wrong. We just want them to have the information so they can make the best decisions for themselves. When they start the program, none of them want to be there. They're so upset. But again, by the second or third week, there's just a big change. And then we find out what are they passionate about. Sometimes our juvenile justice system can feel and look more punitive. And so the idea of if I scare this child, then they won't do it. But kids aren't fully, their frontal cortex of decision-making is not fully developed. I still wonder sometimes if my own is. And so we're expecting them to make good decisions. And DJ, you said this really well too, without a support network around them, but with all these negative influences that are just out on the street, they're just part of our environment. And so I love the fact that you've created a program where the parents do need to participate. And in the beginning, there was resistance, like, do I have to, can't you just fix my kid? I have to go to work, I have to do this, I have to, you know, because our lives are crazy busy. 
So getting over that hump to really see beyond that in a non-judgmental community building way is what you've been able to accomplish. And it sounds like since they don't want to leave the program after it's over, it really speaks to the nurturing and the supportive environment and the non-judgmental environment that you've created. If a child is in a situation like that, but is living with a grandparent or a caregiver or a foster parent, are they then included as the guardian in that program? Exactly how you explained it. Okay. You know, not a parent as long as a guardian. Share about some of the other programs that you offer. Pal Up is an amazing program because it takes high school age kids and it shows them a world that they did not know was there. A lot of kids grow up with the perception of, you know, okay, well, either I go to college, you know, four year university route, or I'm stuck working at McDonald's, mm -hmm. you know, for the rest of my life. And so what Pal Up does is it shows these kids that, no, there's another world out there. So we introduce them. We have workshops. We have guest speakers from different trades, from vocational schools to show them that there's another world out there. Because, you know, we know, and there's, there's no judgment behind this statement. There's no, you know, ill will behind it. But everyone just does not end up going to college, going the university route, right? Mm -hmm. College is just not made for everyone. And so this program really, really caters to to those kids. You know, some of the kids, especially, you know, in the community that we're in, well, they may have to get out of high school and get into something so they can help support their family, so they right. can help support their parents, you right. know, a little faster than going to get a bachelor's degree or, you know, going to get a master's degree. You know, they teach these kids trades, they teach them skills, which... Okay. I feel like is, you know, an art that we're kind of losing sight of, mm -hmm. you know, the electricians, the the plumbers, the, um, you know, linesmen. And so it really, really opens these kids eyes up and, and they love it because they're like, wait a minute, you mean I can get this training, I can get this on the job training, hands on training, because that's what a lot of people want. So we're opening up their eyes to just a whole world that a lot of them didn't realize existed. And you can make some really, really good money in a lot of those professions. And you can grow in those professions. And Absolutely. if you choose to get further your education, whether it's advanced certification or right. even if you decide to go to school later. Absolutely. So that's skill building. And I'm a firm believer in application learning, even at the academic, you know, in a college right. level, my students who are actually putting into practice the theory to test it out are far mm -hmm. more advanced and right. like it better because they're seeing it come to life in a real way. Within that program, do you have sometimes individual mentors who will uh, take on a student or is there a connection that is more one-to-one -one as well? You know, the beautiful thing is that a lot of the speakers that we've had come out have offered just mm -hmm. that to our students. They've given out their contact information, phone numbers, emails, and, you know, kind of put it in the in the student's court. If yeah. you want to reach out, I'm willing to help. And so okay. that just that in itself, you know, has been a blessing because now not only we are we opening their eyes to a world they did not know exists, but now we're also building their network. So much of this world is not always what you know, but also who you know. Absolutely. It's so interesting. I actually just did a presentation for the doctoral program at USC, exactly okay. that, your knowledge network, because even the most academically driven individual has no idea how to network. Right. I know that you all have a sports program and I know you have life camera action, which has to be in the media, Iggy, that has to be in your domain. <laughs> so I'd love for you to talk about each of those because they are significant in and of themselves. Well, if you want Iggy to talk for a very long time, ask him about life camera action. <laughs> I, uh, you're on, Iggy. Life camera action. First of all, I love the name. Got to watch a couple of the videos, loved them. So share with us, what's that about? How did it get started? I like to think of Life Camera Action as the program that focuses on the heart of the child. We see the child in a holistic way here. You know, we have a sports program that, you know, and Fit for Kids we used to have, deals with the body. I like to think of Get It Straight as, you know, giving the kids a good way to think about the realities of their world. My program, Life Camera Action, I see it as an opportunity to give kids not only media skills and leadership skills, because we do put them in front of a camera, they got to mm -hmm. work together as a team. What 
they probably don't realize that they're getting is some emotional development work. Mm -hmm. Really getting them to dig deep inside because if they're able to do that, then they're able to express something real and true about themselves. When I tell them, find a subject that you absolutely love mm -hmm. or something you really hate. Anything that matters to you Great. doesn't matter to the audience because if it doesn't matter to you and you're creating this movie, chances are the audience is going to care either. Mm -hmm. so my job and my, my, my team is to get them to, to find that story. And it's tough mm -hmm. when you ask adults, what's your story? We have trouble figuring that out too, right? Absolutely. So I'm glad mm -hmm. that we have a really good support system here. I have a, an intern from USC mm -hmm. full of social work who is here to help in case the students tap into something troubling, maybe yeah. traumatic. There's mm -hmm. someone here who can help them explore that sounds like it's a bit cathartic for the individual like if they're either passionate about something because they love it or hate it it helps them express a piece of themselves as you said and if it's disconcerting for them in some way you have some support but working through it yeah. is a process that is healing in and of itself it's wonderful to see the finished products these movies at the end and at their film festival at the end of the 10 weeks we we give more points we tell them to those students who were able to be the most honest in their movies. Mm, wow. to good camera work, good editing, obviously, but if you're able to be more honest, mm -hmm. you get more points. I had a student mm -hmm. one time who came to us and he was really passionate about soccer, but I noticed that he was really excited about it. Mr. I want to do my movie about soccer because I'm really good at it and I love to play. But then I noticed that every week he was coming to class and he wasn't doing his work. So his camera didn't have any footage on it. One time he came to class and we were looking at his camera. We noticed that there were photographs that he took of his home. Mm -hmm. And on the walls of his bedroom were like holes in the wall that somebody had punched. So obviously we brought mom in and we mm -hmm. talked to mom to see what was going on. Well, we found out that there was some, some domestic violence mm -hmm. from the father. So he was going through some stuff. And then exploring that a little bit more, he decided on his own that he wanted to do his movie on that instead. Because that's what he was going through at that time. And he ended up winning top prize at the film festival. And, so, and not every student has to do their topic on something, you know, concerning or troubling. They can do it about their dreams and their passions. We want the kids to find that little bit of passion or even just curiosity. But for this child, what was so amazing is you noticed that there was something that was stopping them even from developing something that they loved, like soccer. And so therefore they had to work through that. And if you hadn't intervened or he hadn't had that idea to sort of switch, he might have either given something mediocre or dropped out completely and not done it and not feeling like he could because he was stuck. He was stuck with these feelings and this cloud that he, he needed to figure out with support to be able to work through. And the program clearly aided him in doing that. It's part of, of our program. And to kids who want to have jobs in the media industry, we work with Final Cut Pro. That's the editing software that we teach the kids. So they're learning an app that they use out there in the industry. So they get to put that on their resume. They can possibly get an entry level job in a post-production house. They can That's compete for one, obviously. So it's it's a really good opportunity for them. I think what you're doing is opening up the world to these young people from a sports perspective early on to the parent, to keeping them out of the juvenile justice system and to really offering them career opportunities later on by the skill building that you're doing. It's great. In 2016, um, after being introduced to the School of Social Work, there was another staff member from USC that came and presented to me because they were very curious on how I wanted to integrate some social workers, you know, within a law enforcement, you know, uh, partnered organization. Mm -hmm. And after talking with that individual um, and learning about becoming a teaching institution, I went from saying I'd like to have one um, intern, MSW intern. Mm -hmm. In 2016, you know, I created the first law enforcement social work teaching institution. You know, mental health has such a negative stigma. Oh, I know. Kids are going to be experiencing things that are unfortunate and are going to impact them, right? The goal was to first really minimize that stigma. And my hope was that at least maybe you know, 10 or 20 percent of our kids from Get It Straight and their parents would be open to seeing somebody to talk about their feelings and their emotions. Mm -hmm. 
pleasantly surprised that it it went to like 85 percent i'm very proud of the partnership that we have the world tech school of social work um it's made a huge impact i so appreciate that because i couldn't agree with you more i think therapy counseling can have such a strong stigma and when you actually take the time to build that into a program, you're fostering and normalizing that the tough issues that these kids are facing should be dealt with. And there's a professionalized way to deal with that as part of the community that does not carry shame. We have a soccer league uh, for kids and that really resonates with me, you know, being a kid who played sports all my life sports probably being the thing that kept me out of trouble half the reason i made decisions that i made was based on no i can't do that i got practice we don't know exactly what this particular kid would have been doing on this particular day had he not had a soccer game it's a great offering it's an important offering and it's a really important offering for your younger kids where they can't always express things verbally or artistically in the same way. Right. And so it's a place where they get to just be kids in a structured right. environment safely while still learning skills. So I have to ask you, because for all the nonprofits I interview, COVID has certainly been an issue. I'm sure this is not an exception for you all. Uh, and I want to know how that's impacted the youth since they couldn't go to school for a period of time, still aren't in school in Los Angeles or most of Los Angeles. And i um, just curious about how you all manage that both internally at your organization, but with the programs that you offer. You know, as the leader of this organization, you know, I had to make a tough decision. And I had to weigh um, whether our organization should be considered essential or looking at, you know, what really is defining essential. I made a decision that whether we hadn't decided whether we were essential or not, that it was important for us to not close right away, but to, you know, at least stay open a couple of months so that we as a team can gather all the information that we felt was going to be very important and necessary to our families to to survive. Um, We know a lot of families were losing their jobs, so we knew they were going to go hungry. We knew that... um, the resources were going to be available. So the intent was to find out, create a sheet, let our families know what we're planning to do, Mm -hmm. but not to just disappear right away. We were able to apply for the PPP loan, which gave us another two and a half months. And and I have to give a lot of credit to all of my team because everybody sincerely was looking at the lens, like, how can we help? decide on a team that let's take things on a virtual platform. Let's start creating videos of the contents that we're trying to teach our parents. So the first one we did right away was our Get It Straight. And then with our sports, we figured, okay, well, let's do some virtual clinics. Let's find fun ways to get these kids engaged that we can create these challenges and then be able to give them a gift card. Oh, great idea. For Pal Up, same thing. We, because of what Zoom offers, we're able to have breakout sessions. So the volunteers that we do have, because we we do have a, a couple of volunteers and we're getting more volunteers and we still need more volunteers because not only do we bring presenters to talk to these kids and, and give them the information of different careers that are out there. But the important thing is helping them build these resumes, right? And then for Ignacio's program, um, you know, he decided that it's so difficult to try to teach just on a virtual platform, but there's so many technical things that these kids are going to really need. And if we really wanted to teach them that skill that we looked at, how can we bring them back And so that took a while because we wanted to make sure we weren't jumping into something and putting anybody in in risk. We decided to bring that program back, but in a very small scale. And we've been blessed. We never closed. Yeah, it's amazing. I got a chance to work with Get It Straight, another department, in Mm -hmm. developing their curriculum, their 12-week programs on a virtual platform. So that meant videotaping all of their lessons. So I think what that did as an organization for that department in this case, it forced them to really look at their curriculum, taking out the fat to really make the program leaner and more efficient. Mm-hmm. And um, there's no one here from that Get a Straight team to speak about it, but I'm sure that um, Amy Roa, she's the lead from that program. She would agree that, yeah. The way you describe the programmatic pieces infuses that same buy-in. And when COVID hit, you applied that same philosophy that allowed you to think more creatively, reevaluate, 
tighten up and use it for the benefit of the program and the community you serve. Kudos to your entire team and to the leadership because the leadership that you receive is also then your ability to implement that as part of your program values. Well, Laura, you know why I love my job. I have an amazing team. We really love and respect each other. We're a family here. And, you know, we want to make sure that we uplift one another. And, and they do that for me all the time. They may not know it. And, and I have to remind myself and thank you for your the way you summarized it because I could not do or lead this team without the members that I have. Yeah. And also I have a great board. I wanted to mention that I have a great sure, board. Yeah. They're not there because of their egos. They're there because they want to help. It's easy to step up for a leader like Lorraine. She's passionate about our passions. She's passionate about allowing you know her staff to do the things that they are passionate about. And when you get a leader like that, which in the world that I've been in and the leaders that I've had is rare, you know, it makes it super easy to to step up and say, okay, what, you know, what's next? How can I help? You know, myself being a police officer, Lorraine not being my direct supervisor because it's a partnership. I still I call her Commander Garcia. Um, <laughs> I love it. It's great. <laughs> she's awesome. She makes it easy. Small and Gutsy is sponsored by the Intrinsic Group, my boutique management consulting firm specializing in guiding organizations to leverage talent, optimize processes, and to ensure the organization's narrative is aligned with their culture. We'd love to invite you to be a sponsor. So if you're interested in sponsoring Small and Gutsy to keep it going, please reach out to me at reachus at theintrinsicgroup.com. As you all may know or not know, uh, toward the end of our podcast, I always ask, some quick gutsy questions. So if you all are ready, I'll ask them. They're fun and um, and it's just whatever's at the top of your head that comes up. If the answer to this question cannot be donations, money, or funding, what is at the top of your wish list for Holland Beck Powell's? It's for people to get involved. My biggest hope is that more people know about Powell. Mm -hmm. more eyeballs on our social networks. <laughs> Just for people to kind of know what we're doing, what's going on at PAL. And, you know, me personally coming from the law enforcement side, mm -hmm. you know, for more people to, to, to see what we're doing and, and understand that, you know, the department, law enforcement and the community, you know, there's a larger portion, which I feel is the silent majority that are together and that want to be together. Mm -hmm. um, and that things aren't as separated as what we all are perceiving and, you know, mm -hmm. what's what's being put out there. Yeah, beautifully said that the more there can be the efforts of law enforcement and community together that do mix really well. And what's really the purpose of law enforcement, a piece of right. it, right? It's right. Yeah. Exactly. Just a piece yeah. of the puzzle because we can yeah. see that we all work together. If you were to think of a song that describes Helen Beck Pal, what would it be? <laughs> for me it would be the ain't no mountain high enough ain't no mountain high enough you're going to definitely nothing is going to stop you there's going to be no barrier to keep you from doing the work you do that is a really good question well I, as you think of yours i'm going to just agree with lorraine yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I, think, I think it's a perfect perfect i mean there's a lot of song titles out there that sort of say the same thing but it's true i mean like many nonprofits out there, we we struggle to climb that mountain. Mm -hmm. um, but boy, does it feel good mm -hmm. when we do, you know, and we get to the top and we can tell other people mm -hmm. how to get up with us, you know, so that's a great title. I agree with that one. Got it. Ironically, this is my son, my 11 year old son's favorite song. But and although I can't remember or know all every single lyric but just kind of what i envision when i think of michael jackson's man in the mirror everyone looking within mm -hmm. because i feel like that's what each one of our staff members you mm -hmm. know in our leadership do we all look within to see how we can make a change mm -hmm. and you know we really try to um you know impart that on the kids that we work with it starts mm -hmm. with you it starts with self-accountability you have the power to to make whatever change you want to make in this world you just got to see it in yourself and hopefully hopefully you know we have been able to help these kids see just to see the fact that they have this power brilliant 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 needs no commentary no, no. yeah <laughs> great i loved it it was great what makes your organization gutsy how is Hallenbeck beck pal gutsy because it definitely is 
I think it's gutsy just simply in the things that we attempt to tackle. Our Get It Straight program, we are actively going after to work with, to help, to heal kids that are already going straying, kids that are already on the bubble. Our goal is to go into these, what we call, you know, in our, in, in my world, hot spots, areas that are perceived to be more troubled. You know, we, we, we want the kids that are perceived as a challenge. We want to work with them and we want to help them. We want to heal them. You know, it's, it's, it's not give me the straight A students. Right. It's not give me the perfectly behaved students. We are really, really trying. And, you know, I think that HPAL, you know, in that, in that way is, is very gutsy because it's not an easy task. I would agree with you. I think the fact that you're seeking that makes you very gutsy. The way I see PAL as gutsy is, and I see it a lot of times when I'm able to participate or just listen in or witness the bigger picture meetings that Lorraine and the executive team have. If I step back and I see what we do, it's like, you can work together. We can do it. Yes, we've been doing it. I see that as gutsy. I think that we look as an organization that challenges is how, you know, whether it's a negative challenge, like how do we bring about people looking at it differently and how do we mm-hmm. take the challenge on and take it as, as a way for us to grow, you know, and mm-hmm. I think especially during these times where law enforcement really was looked at in a very, very, very negative way, like Amy mentioned, we're not afraid to try things. What is something that outsiders or maybe even some insiders don't know about Helen Beck Powell? Especially at the beginning, because we're partner in partnership with, with, with LAPD, with the city, they believe that we're all city funded. They don't realize that we start at zero every year. It's a great point. You are a separate 501c3. You're a separate entity. But just because you're named, because you're in partnership, that can be really misleading. Yeah, it's a great point. If you could get one celebrity or influencer to endorse or talk about Holland Beck Powell, who might that be? So one is Dr. Phil, just because I know it's not the same that most or you know, traditional work that you're going to on the spot tell somebody what to do from a mm-hmm. aspect, but, you know, his, you know that he's there to make a positive change and help his guests understand. And because, you know, everybody watches him, I think the thing that we're all hoping is for people to know what we do. And you said you had another. Did you have another? I didn't. I, could, I can hashtag anybody. Kim Kardashian, because of the reform she's doing but then i mean she wouldn't have normally been somebody that would say i love that you see how passionate she is about wanting to help individuals that have been incarcerated right right that is true you know one person that comes to mind and this is going to sound kind of cliche right but it's not just because they're one of my you know top or kind of you know favorite actors or actresses but before i say that name (laughs) If you listen to this person speak without knowing who they are, mm-hmm. I feel like you'd have no choice but to respect this person and their work ethic and mm-hmm. how much they preach, you know, how important it is to just not give up and right. to work hard. And I really feel like, you know, that's kind of one of the things that at the heart of what we really, you know, what, we, what we're trying to, what we're trying to do, you mm-hmm. know, and what we're trying to teach these kids, but Will Smith is a person that I can really, really get behind. You know, he talks about how he may not be the most talented person in the world, but he will outwork 99% of of people. And, you know, I feel like if someone with that type of mindset can get behind an organization that they honestly believe, you know what I mean, has are, are like-minded, then um, mm-hmm. I feel like that would be, that could be amazing. Mine is easy. Oprah. Oh, yeah, that would be uh, good. I'm going to hashtag her. You never know. All she has to do is say Hollenbeck Powell. And it's all she says, <laughs> yeah. nope. You all have been incredible. Tell my listeners, how can somebody reach you, whether they want your services or volunteer or donate? What's the best way to find Hollenbeck Powell? Well, that would probably be our website, lapdhollenbeckpowell.org, and all our programs are there, our links to all our social media platforms. Um, for more information, lapdhollandbeckpal.org. We're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, uh, Facebook, um, and we have our own YouTube channel where we showcase our best videos that highlight our programs. Well, I want to take a moment 
and thank you so much for spending time with me today. I knew a little bit about your program. I did I didn't know anywhere near what your program does and has accomplished and what you were able to do during COVID-19. So I just want to take a moment and thank each of you, Lorraine, DJ, and Iggy, for spending time with me today. Our thank pleasure. you yes. so much. Yeah, thank you for what you do because it's so um, it's so important, you know, for people like yourself who who genuinely want to shine the light on other things and other organizations that you know we're all doing God's work. Everyone who you you know shined a light on is so very important. So you have no clue how much that is appreciated, and you may never know what effect that you've really had on these organizations. Thank you. That means a lot to me uh, because it's a passion project, right? We've talked about passion. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Give us some stars and write a review on Apple or wherever you listen to podcasts or buy us a coffee. Buymeacoffee.com backslash small and gutsy. So here's another shout out. Michael says, Laura does a great job finding nonprofits and social impact organizations that I've never heard of before. Thanks, Michael. Really appreciate it. And we do our best. I want to thank my partners in this endeavor, my co-producer, sound engineer and composer, the amazing Pavel Franson, my exceptionally talented graphic designer, Nate Addy, my social work intern extraordinaire, Stephanie Tran. Please check out their bios on the Intrinsic website and all the folks, friends, and family who have guided and inspired me. Our blog of these small and gutsy nonprofits and social impact organizations can be found in the organizational story section of the Intrinsic Group website so that we can continue to link clients, volunteers, future employees, investors, and donors to this small but mighty network. Of course, we can take responsibility outside of our own vetting of the organizations we interview. So before you sign on to support or work for them, we encourage you to do your own due diligence and research them as well. We just want you to learn about the small and gutsy nonprofit and social impact organizational sector so they can spread their story and their impactful work. From small and gutsy to big with impact, I'm Laura Whitkoff, and thanks for listening.